and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to LifeWave's next humanitarian drone, the Voyager. Now, you might notice that uh, this one is very different than our flying wing, and that's for very, very good purpose and reason. The mission statement of this drone is uh, very different than the flying wing, and we're going to be getting into uh, talking about that in just a moment. Uh, but just uh, first a comment about this. This started as just like anything else, an idea and a concept. And uh, this is something that I've worked with my son on and a group of engineers that are very talented and working together uh, collectively. We've been able to bring this to life. And now this drone is capable of something that no other drone in the world is capable of. So we've been able to take a, a basic idea, create a dream, and then turn that dream into a reality. And uh, we've done this all within uh, less than one year. So we're going to get into some of the details behind this, and uh, to do that, uh, I'd like to welcome back onto stage our global vice president of sales, Ryan Barson. So, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? It's, it's kind of fun for me to be out here right now with David after that kind of a reveal. And that's, a, that's impressive. I've known about this for a little bit, but I had to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we've had a tremendous amount of fun. I, I would say that when you start a project like this, uh, the first thing is you probably have noticed it doesn't really have much of any wings. Uh, last year, we unveiled a flying wing, and this year we're unveiling something that virtually has no wings. Uh, so we could talk about that as a concept. Uh, first, you know, the idea behind this was back in the 1950s, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Custer, and he was looking at uh, the concept of how airplanes actually fly, and it occurred to him that when you have an airplane, it has to develop a specific amount of speed before it can actually get off the ground so his thought is, why don't we invert that principle, and instead of developing ground speed, instead what we'll do is move the speed of the air over the wing more rapidly. So effectively what this does is it has an active system for pushing uh, air through this giant ring, and that creates lift. So the advantage of this is that you could have this one uh, parked in your garage and it could take off from your street and it could land on your street. The, th this model, which is our uh, second prototype, this is what we would call our phase two. Uh, phase one was a model uh, about one meter or so in length, about three feet in length. Uh, this new model uh, that you see over here is uh, about 10, 11 feet in length but yet it only requires a takeoff distance of about uh, 35 feet or so. Uh, the next phase that we're building, which is significantly bigger than this one, uh, that will have a takeoff distance of about 20 feet or so. Uh, so what that means is if we use the fires in Maui as an example, we can take off and land right from the beach or from a street, and uh, then off we go. It one of the things that stands out to me, not only is that incredible, but you, you talk a lot about dreams and not stealing your dreams, and this is a dream of yours to make a difference in the lives of other people. And, and the fires in Maui is just one example of many where people are, are challenged over the, uh, all over the world. But th those dreams, you don't want people to steal your dreams. Where are you headed from here? What, what are your dreams for the future? Well, I mentioned that the uh, purpose of this was going to be very different from the flying wing. And with uh, the flying wing concept, we've been developing new cutting-edge power generation technology 
to uh, power that drone so it can stay in the air longer than any other drone. And so you can imagine if you had a better way to generate electricity that was completely clean, uh, that might have some applications in powering your home or recharging your electric cars, which we're being forced to build. Uh, buy, rather. You know, so <laughs> this is the issue, is uh, where are we going to get our electricity from? So um, solar has its disadvantages, wind has its disadvantages, and putting uh, power generation systems into drones is a excellent way of having a real-world test to see if something's going to work before we roll it out for other applications. For this drone, uh, we're testing something entirely different. Uh, first, uh, we're testing new methods of propulsion uh, that don't currently exist. So in the starter models, I'd say it, there's six phases of development on this project, and we're currently in phase three. So uh, phase one, as I mentioned, was uh, just to see, is this thing going to work? And then phase two is what you've actually seen flying now. Uh, so based on those successful tests, we're going over to phase three. But in addition to propulsion, uh, we're looking at communication systems. So the idea, one of the things that's been incredibly, and this now will kind of be the punchline, um, <laughs> one of the things that's been incredibly alarming, I think, to all of us is the suppression of free speech and that we don't have uh, free communications the way we're supposed to. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to be testing with this, you can think of this as a terrestrial Starlink. Uh, so imagine you can put one of these things up in international waters and use it as a uh, communications tower that's not running on 5G and actually using something that's healthy and beneficial. Um, we could have uh, our own communication system, uh, so we could have freedom of, real freedom of speech uh, by having a, a network of these things around. So my ultimate goal with this is uh, to use this very novel design uh, to have, uh, basically have a terrestrial uh, satellite system. So instead of spending billions of dollars to put uh, satellites up in orbit, we can use new technology uh, to have these things around the planet in the atmosphere uh, functioning as communication nodes. Are, are all of you hearing what he's saying? <laughs> what's, what's fascinating to me is you've undoubtedly heard talk of energy, innovation in energy fields. You've heard talk of innovation in communication, doing things a lot differently than what's mostly accepted today. You also happened to see just a few minutes ago some slides of the Welcome Center that David didn't want to talk about. Are you see where, do you see where this is going? It's the innovation, the dreams, not letting someone steal your dreams. And that, that innovation is what attracted me to LifeWave in the, in the first place. And I remember during one of our first conversations, and I mentioned this yesterday when I talked, you said something that really got to me. And it was, I don't ever want, I want to be an innovator. I want to do things differently. I want to think 15, 20 years in the future. I don't want me too products, or to put it a different way, I don't want copycat products, products you can buy anywhere else. We have that now with patches. So communication's part of it, power's part of it. Where, else, where, do, you see, where, are other, where do you see the rest of this going? And what are your well, dreams for LifeWave in the future? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about uh, first the capabilities of this because if we talk about the capabilities, then uh, some of those things are gonna become kind of self-evident, right? So one of the things that we've already done with this in addition to short takeoff and landing is the loiter speed. So today, if we wanted to take a drone and we wanted to uh, hover it over a target, uh, so let's say we use a practical example. We had the unfortunate hurricane that went through Florida and we had 20,000 homes that got wiped out. And uh, if they had had our drone technology, uh, they could have created um, a map of the damaged area within about three or four days as opposed to the uh, over six weeks that it took doing it from the ground. So when we're talking about the ability to loiter over a target, uh, typically we're going to think of quadcopters. And the problem with quadcopters is that the endurance is limited to maybe 15 minutes, 20, 30 minutes at most. So there are very significant uh, disadvantages there. We can't effectively loiter over a target uh, with 
a conventional drone. Uh, they're just flying too quickly. And if we want to include a VTOL module uh, in the drone, the flight time is limited with battery power to about six or eight minutes. So in our drone that you've seen, uh, how would I say this? Off-the-shelf technology allows for a flight of about six minutes on VTOL. Our drone is different. Uh, we're using other tech that we invented for that. So there's very, very serious uh, downsides. With this drone, we don't need to take either of those approaches. We don't need a complicated uh, vertical takeoff and landing system. We don't need anything like a quadcopter. There's technology that's built into this that allows it to fly uh, today at about 10 miles per hour uh, over a target uh, without requiring any extra blades to do that, like you would have with a quadcopter. So it's extraordinarily efficient, and um, it works extremely well. All of this innovation, where, where are we going with this? What, what do you see as the future for LifeWave in general and for all the people who are here today and all those who are watching virtually? Uh, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about this so they can understand where we're, we're going okay, with let's it. let's do it. I know you're excited to get to that part, Mr. Sales Guy. Yes, yes, I, yes. I know that. I know that. But I, I, I want to go through this just a Perfect. little bit more because then it will, uh, we should tell the story a little bit more. Uh, another thing about this drone. So when we think about natural disasters... Right? One of the big, big problems is there's going to be heavy winds. Or when you're trying to get into uh, places, maybe at extreme altitudes, uh, the weather is going to play a significant role. And uh, conventional drones uh, have a limit of maybe 15 to 20 miles an hour uh, in terms of wind gusts, what they can handle. And of course, you know, hurricanes would be much, much higher than that. So we actually flew this in 15 mile an hour winds, and it was completely resistant to uh, those wind gusts. Didn't care about it, you know, one way or another uh, because of the design. So the good thing about this is that when there is a natural disaster, when there's an emergency, uh, we don't have to wait until the weather improves before getting a drone in the air. Uh, this is not going to care one way or the other. So that's important. Because where we're going in the future, Ryan, <laughs> is this place where we can uh, use this technology uh, first to provide humanitarian relief, and this uh, redefines the network marketing industry. It's good for every company, and it gives every company an opportunity to say, yeah, look what LifeWave has done with innovation and with humanitarian relief, and hopefully we can get people to start looking at our industry in an entirely different way. So that's one of the things I, I want to see coming out of this. Is that what you were looking for? It's actually a different answer than I was looking for, but I want to go with that one for a minute. So looking at our industry in an entirely different way, We've had a few discussions during this uh, event about companies that maybe haven't done things the same way that LifeWave has done. You're looking to create a company that stands out among all network marketing companies that is truly different, not just because we stand here on stage and say we're different, but that we are different. Yeah, you know, this really starts with the mindset of uh, making innovation, a commitment to research, uh, putting money into that time and resources, people, to uh, have that as the very foundation of everything else that you're doing. So the idea is uh, looking at the various trends. So uh, back in 2008, I was looking at where the trends in health and science, and those trends were in stem cells. So we began working back then on ways to activate stem cells in the human body. And of course, ultimately, uh, that led to the release of X39. So we can all relate to how a commitment, a long-term commitment to innovation, uh, putting millions of dollars into research, is going to result in products uh, that present phenomenal 
business opportunities. So today, we don't have any competitors for our patch technology. Uh, And that's because we continue to invest money, we continue to develop uh, new products instead of uh, resting on the ones that we have. So, you know, thinking beyond that, uh, what are the trends of where things are going in the next five to ten years? Well, we could say um, our food supply is corrupted. Uh, there are unspeakable things being done with genetic engineering with our food. So we have to be able to have control over our food supply and grow our own food. Um, wow. I'm glad they like that. That's a good one. I would dare, based on that response, I would dare to say um, that we should be concerned with our water. Our water has... Our water, drinking water, is toxic, polluted. You can't drink the water. You don't want to shower in the water. So we need to have better technology to provide uh, water that's clean. Uh, and, of course, go beyond that. Uh, we want to think about water as an opportunity to heal the human body. Right? So with these drones, it gives us the opportunity to uh, test new technology in power generation, in communications, and look at how are these going to be uh, platforms that we could potentially use for the future. So as an example, when we talk about communications, we all live through the pandemic, and we all live through an era where if you said, and I know this because it happened to LifeWave, I happened to put an article out on the use of vitamin C as an effective means of treating viral infections and Facebook flagged that and took the post down, uh, despite the fact that this was a study published by the National Institute of Health. It's like, how can you suppress a government study? This is ridiculous. So, uh, so we want to be thinking about these things. Um, and, uh, and, and thinking about these trends so that if we're putting uh, millions of dollars into the research, and we're putting five years, ten years, whatever you know the period of time is going to be. Uh, but it's important just to get started, and um, just get started, just get going, and then see how it develops. And uh, the drone side of our research has been going incredibly well. It's it is going better than any other uh, project I think that I've worked on. So there, there's no question it's going to be successful. One of the... That's fantastic. One of the things that stands out to me, you said this yesterday, you've said it again today, we're a technology company, that our efforts in driving technology to a, a certain degree will help create new potential products, new opportunities, new trends, maybe that we could be at the forefront of. You, you, we talked a little bit about Star Trek, and you, you brought up how the underlying theme, underneath heart to heart, is Star Trek. Well, some of those things, I'm going to tie it to the space program if I can. Innovations that we take advantage of today started in the 60s, when the space program was developing. All kinds of direction and movement and places led to other technologies that they weren't even looking for. Same hold true for LifeWave? Same holds true, absolutely. Uh, when I started the research on stem cells, at first I was thinking that we needed uh, a type of external electromagnetic field to signal uh, the activation of stem cells. So we began to develop um, these novel uh, coils that produced uh, a novel shape for a pulsed electromagnetic field, and this ended up having a therapeutic effect. But as we got through the research, eventually that led to the development of X39. So it's important when you start out on a research program that you don't necessarily want to be tied into any one specific outcome. Uh, you have to be very organic and flexible because you don't know what direction things are, are going to take based on the research that you do. So in other words, um, this would be in the category of unexpected results. You run experiments, 
uh, you create prototypes, and then you may see and observe an outcome where you get an aha moment and you say, oh, uh, this is something I need to pay attention to. Let's go ahead and investigate this and let's see if we can create something new from it. So you can, it's totally okay that you start with one concept and it develops into something else. So the, the flying wing came first and uh, that's been an absolutely uh, you know, critical part of what we're doing uh, for humanitarian aid. Uh, but this was the next step. It doesn't look like the logical next step, but uh, when I began to look at the operational parameters of uh, the flying wing and what it was capable of, I thought, okay, I, I want to take this now and uh, create something new with it. So I was able to reach out to uh, uh, three engineers and uh, present them with a concept, and they said, oh, we, we've got absolutely something in mind for this, and uh, you know, it was a collaborative effort to get to where we are today. Just phenomenal stuff. Would, you, would it be safe to say, David, that you are thinking five, ten plus years in the future in terms of innovation and trends and tapping into those and creating opportunities for the people in this room? Oh, no, you think 20 years ahead. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, you, you think 20 years ahead because uh, you, you want to look, 10 years is almost a little bit too short. Uh, there's certainly going to be many innovations that make it to market within the next five to 10 years. And at the rate at which information is doubling uh, and there are new discoveries being made, uh, you have to stay on top of those things and uh, be able to respond to them. But you do want to take uh, the best guess at where we could potentially be in 20 years, right? So. 20 years, we'd say that drones are going to be um, an intimate part of our life. We're going to be getting deliveries of food by drones. You know, you'll be able to have an app and get a pizza delivered or Chinese food delivered by a drone. Uh, you're going to get your mail delivered by a drone. Amazon's already doing this. They have a number of patents on it. Uh, there's already trials being done to deliver organs in the future, and that organ donations are going away. We're going to 3D print organs. So uh, God forbid, you know, you develop diabetes. Um, you'll be able to uh, have a doctor 3D print a pancreas, insert it into your body, and then inject stem cells from a 25-year-old. And now you have a 25-year-old pancreas, even though you might be 50, 60, 70 years old. So these are all things, you know, that are going to be happening in uh, the not-too-distant future. So when we think about the opportunities for drones, when I look at communications and the reason why it impacts us, number one, we need our own system of communications so we can't be shut down. And then the next thing we need... <laughs> the, next thing, the next thing we need, we might want to say, is... Um, by 2030, right, so just around the corner now, by 2030, it's estimated that the amount of money the communication industry will generate by drones will be $200 billion globally. So this is an enormous market, and so if you can go into that market with a technology that nobody else has and everybody wants, then we can create an unbelievably powerful business opportunity. So that's the thinking of looking that forward into the future. That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is the definition of innovation for a technology <laughs> company. Well, we didn't talk about the performance numbers on let's this. Let's talk about that. Okay, let's do that. So we talked about that it's short takeoff and landing. We talked about that it can fly as low as uh, 10 miles an hour. You know, keep in mind, when most planes are landing, they're landing, they have to be traveling 90, 120 miles an hour and more uh, in order to land. And uh, this can land only going 10 miles an hour. Uh, as a matter of fact, now we can show <laughs> that video that you were seeing before. Um, this was unbelievably fun to get this out and see it fly for the first time. Because a lot of people said, oh, this is never going to fly. Uh, but here it took off on the very first flight at about uh, 35 miles per hour. 
And on this day, uh, it was the winds were, you can see it's a little cloudy, the winds were uh, 13, 15 miles per hour. And uh, this would not be good weather where we'd normally would want to fly an aircraft, uh, but it was actually really excellent conditions for us to test the stability of this drone. Uh, one of the things that you'll know, notice is that this aircraft is almost entirely devoid of control surfaces. And uh, this uses a technique which is very similar to what we've done on our flying uh, wing, which we have uh, what are called elevons uh, to control left, right, up, and down. And uh, the advantage of this is that we don't need a tail, and uh, we found another way to uh, counter torque. So it minimizes the complexity and improves the reliability. And you can see it just kind of floats along and does a really slow flyby. Um, the other thing, of course, we're going to show in just a minute as it turns around here is that it can land uh, equally in a very, very short distance. So in these initial tests, uh, it's been a distance of about 30 feet or so. And there it goes. It puts right down. So um, again, you can imagine that in an emergency situation like what we had in Hawaii recently, uh, we could take off and land anywhere, wouldn't have to be at an airport. Uh, this could stay in the air for a really long time, and it could just uh, act as a uh, communications network for uh, people on the ground. So, of course, this is going to have cameras, it'll have infrared, and it will be able to look for survivors, but it's also going to, uh, if uh, cell phones get wiped out, this then conceivably can act as a uh, communications node so people can have cell service uh, if, that's, uh, if that's a mission parameter we decide to go with. Which I think they lost in Hawaii during those fires. Exactly. That's the whole point. Yeah. That's the whole point is we can put this up in the air for a very, very long period of time uh, in almost all weather conditions, uh, you know, the rain or heavy winds, and uh, it provides those reliable communications. Uh, the other thing that's worth note noting on this is I mentioned that there's six phases to this. And um, phase one was the test. Phase two is what you've seen. Phase three is what we're going towards. So um, in phase two, which is this drone that flies, it will have uh, about a maximum speed of 65 miles per hour. So that's uh, very slow and uh, very conservative compared to the flying wing that we have. Um, in phase three, uh, the objective is to uh, change a variable on this, and uh, we project that it will be able to fly about two, three hundred miles per hour. And so the idea is you could take off from anywhere uh, at very, very uh, low speeds, get up to altitude, fly two, three hundred miles per hour, get to your target, and then you can hover there at 10 miles per hour and uh, provide the services that you need to. And then in phase four and five, uh, we're going to go a little bit faster than that. Phase four uh, is getting more up into the range of uh, 600, 700 miles per hour. And then uh, phase five is uh, supersonic. And then phase six. So think about what phase six might mean. <laughs> phase six. Well, as uh, Lucius Fox said to Bruce Wayne, oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the perfect thing to say to someone so that it garners more interest. Yes. Uh, yeah, so phase six, I would say, would be uh, what we might call speculative engineering. Uh, so this would be... Uh, looking at nature and looking for examples. And so uh, there's a very, very interesting phenomena. Uh, there's a fellow uh, that I was introduced to uh, who had been doing work for the Department of Defense. And looking at this phenomena where there was a plane uh, flying around Bimini and uh, it was going through a thunderstorm and uh, it went through this uh, specific zone in the thunderstorm, and uh, within about 10 seconds, it appeared several hundred miles away. And uh, what was found was that there was a phenomena that was uh, created in this uh, cloud uh, where there was a uh, magnetic tripole, 
and uh, this allowed for a folding of space. And so it, what happened in this one uh, incident, which is very well documented, is that this plane uh, traveled several hundred miles uh, within about 10 seconds, and uh, it still had an extra eight gallons of fuel uh, that was in the airplane, so that when it landed, uh, I think this was up over towards Fort La Lauderdale or something, um, it was determined that there was no way the plane had enough fuel to get over there. This was a small plane. So uh, in the type of experiments that we look at, we use this novel shape to create uh, an electromagnetic bubble. And uh, we want to see that if we could attain speeds with this, uh, that wouldn't normally be achievable. I think that's a good way of saying it. Literally Star Trek. <laughs> Literally Star Trek. I was going to say we're creating a warp bubble, that, but that was going a little bit too far, but that's literally what it is. Yes, very. that is absolutely phenomenal. How many of you are excited to be part of a company that is this innovative? <laughs> so, David, what do you see as the future for LifeWave? future is amazing. Um, we're, the, I think the takeaway on this, right, there should be a takeaway. The first thing is where we are today is that we have a phenomenal line of products that no other company has. We have a phenomenal business opportunity, and we have a commitment to helping those in need through existing humanitarian programs. And every single one of those areas, we're going to continue to support invest money in and grow. So in the area of product development today, you have patches, but in the not so distant future, you're going to have other technologies that improve health and wellness and beyond. In our business opportunity, we're going to be utilizing new technology like holograms and things that you haven't even seen yet uh, to support your business building efforts. So you can uh, be building your business and earning money faster and easier than ever before and doing it in less time so you have time for your friends and family. And then finally, we're going to be using technology like the drones uh, to, to provide humanitarian effort and take matters into our own hands so that when uh, there is a humanitarian crisis, we can be responding to that so we can work with organizations like the Red Cross, like Convoy of Hope and others, and, um, and uh, saving people's lives. That's what this is really all about, developing better tools to help those in need. And when we do all of these things, we totally redefine the network marketing industry. So 10 years from now, the pe when people look at networking, they say, oh my God, I want to be involved in this industry. Look how amazing it is, and look what companies are doing like LifeWave. I am personally thrilled to be part of a category-creating company, category-creating in a number of areas, from patches to all the innovation that you've just talked about to all of it. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand and give this amazing individual a massive <laughs> round of applause.